In this video, I'm going to be building the 172nd scale Saviola Marchetti S55A by Dora Wings. I'm James and welcome back to LPJ Models. Before we get stuck in, I'd like to announce the return of our local model show. Hosted by my local club, the North Devon Model Society, our first show in several years is going to take place on Sunday, August the 13th at the Park School in Barnstable, Devon. So if you fancy a day out and want to see some great models and maybe pick up a few bargains from the traders, then come on down. For more details, visit our website at northdevonmodelsociety.co.uk or head over to our Facebook page. Okay, so let's take a quick look inside the box before we start the build. The instructions are quite nicely presented, although they could have gone into more detail in certain areas. The parts generally look quite nice out of the box. There are some nice details on the sprue with finer parts being nicely rendered. But of course there are limitations in moulding small parts in styrene. Also supplied are two resin engines, which are really nice. Alongside a sheet of photo etch, some nice paint masks and some decograph decals. I thought the decals looked especially nice. The clear parts is where we start to run into a few problems. Insufficient polishing of the mould has led to these portholes looking a bit bad. But luckily, the main canopy looks all right. Also for this build, I designed a suite of 3D parts in Fusion 360. These range from fairly substantial to almost invisible. Some parts were essential to replace the slightly overscale plastic parts like the pitot tube and the gun mounts. I also designed a nice torpedo, but I couldn't get it to print right, which was a real shame. You'll see these parts pop up throughout the build. Anyway, to start the build off, as usual, the parts were removed from their sprues with my god hand single edge sprue cutters. These provide a nice clean cut and really help to avoid excessive cleanup. Throughout this build, I'm using VMS Styrene Cement Fast Setting to glue my plastic parts together. The construction starts with the gondolas. Being a float plane and a catamaran style, these are quite a prominent part of the build. So, they were a pretty good place to start. With a little bit of teasing, I managed to get these parts together. Although I do predict that I might have to use a little bit of filler just to bring this build up to scratch. Just a quick note, Dora Wings are a short run model producer, and this usually means there's a little bit more work involved than if you were building, say, a Tamiya kit. But there's a benefit with short run models, and that is that the companies can usually produce more obscure subjects because the molding costs are usually a little bit lower, providing us with a wealth of weird and wonderful vehicles to build. There was conflicting evidence as to the interior colour of this aircraft. There are very few sources available, some say grey and some say wood. So for the inside of my gondolas, I went with some MRP pale wood. After tackling the painting on the inside of the gondolas, I had to tackle those tiny windows. And I just couldn't bring myself to use the kit parts. So I came up with the plan of using some clear UV cure resin that I bought from Amazon. This stuff's around 15 quid. Let's hope it'll be clear enough. Anyway, I decanted some onto some foil to protect my palette and used a toothpick to pick it up and place it in the porthole apertures. Because the resin is quite thick and viscous, this worked quite well and was fairly easy to apply. Each porthole took a drop around the edge and then a drop in the middle to break the surface tension. To make sure the windows sat level, I made sure that I had more resin than I needed so I could just sand it away if I needed to. The resin windows were cured with UV light and it took around 45 seconds. Don't worry, you don't have to do it in the dark. I did this for dramatic effect. Before sanding, you need to make sure the resin has cooled down. Otherwise things become a sticky mess. Anyway, once they were fully cured, I scraped away some of the excess resin with a fresh 10A scalpel blade. I tried to cut this as flush to the fuselage as I could to minimise cleanup later. But we all knew there was going to be some sanding involved, right? I worked my way down the grits from around 600 to 1000. And once I was certain everything was smooth, I polished out any more abrasions with some polishing compound. For this I used K-Colour Cutting Compound number 3, but any will work okay. And I think it came out great. Now it's time for part one of my masochistic 3D printing adventures. Because the resin I used didn't have the raised ringlet around the porthole, I had to print my own. And these were microscopic. 
Because the parts were so small, I had to be really careful, hence my rather novel approach to sanding smooth the rear surface. Anyway, these were glued in place carefully with a PVA glue. But even being glued in place, they were quite delicate, so I had to be really careful not to damage any throughout the build. Inside one of the gondolas is a winch for the anchor. The original parts were supplied with photo etch and a piece of styrene, but I thought both parts were a bit thin and flimsy, so I printed out my own. I then wrapped around some scale rope from Ropes in Scale for an authentic look. I made the shaft for the winch longer than it needed to be, so that I could cut it down to make sure it fit perfectly. And this was glued in place with VMS Flexi CA for photo edge. I then bought both of the halves of the gondola together. Because most of the interior was visible, I kept weathering to a minimum, as in zero. On the outside of the gondolas, there were some seams that needed dealing with. So I filled these with some trusty sprue goo and then waited 24 hours for them to dry. Sprue goo is an absolutely fantastic filler if you're not in a rush. But unlike other fillers, it sands exactly like the plastic it came from. It took a little while to brute force my way down the grits while sanding the gondolas. I kept having to go back and fill bits that I'd missed, or areas that weren't quite as level as they needed to be. But it was worth it in the end. Next up, I glued the upper surfaces to the gondola. I know this is a float plane, but at the moment it's looking a lot more float than plain. Once those parts were added, it was time to start work on the cockpit. Despite the size of the aircraft, the cockpit looks pretty cramped. And there is a nice amount of detail tucked away in here that you're probably not going to see again. Some spars and firewalls were added before moving on to some of the more detailed parts of the cockpit. The throttle quadrant was quite complex, and it consisted of about 6 to 8 photo etch parts mounted onto a tiny piece of styrene. So to make this easier, I kept the styrene part attached to the sprue, before adding the photo etch parts carefully on. This made it much less likely that I'd knock any parts off before being able to put it on the model. Here I'm using some VMS black superglue, mainly so I can see where I've put it. It's a shame all that delicate work is pretty much going to be lost forever. The throttle quadrant was then glued onto the firewall, very carefully so as not to break it. Before I carried on with the cockpit, I decided to cut some styrene sheet to strips and use this to reinforce the join between the centre and the outer wing sections. I thought that the spars on their own may not be enough to keep the wings lined up. After some test fitting, I was fairly happy, so it was time to move on to some paint. Once again, I cracked out my MRP pale wood and I got spraying with my 0.15 Hardrin Steam Bag. The paint was sprayed around 15 PSI. Some details were picked out in the cockpit with various Vallejo colours. Although I wanted this to be fairly tidy, I didn't go crazy with detail, because this will be hidden underneath a canopy, which is going to be hidden underneath some engines. So it might look a bit rudimentary. The seats, which were a mix of photo etch and styrene, were then glued into place. And then I gave everything a wash of Abtalung 502 sepia, thinned with VMS Universal Weathering Carrier Light. Just enough to pick out some of those details. The top of the centre fuselage section was then glued into place. This took a bit of clamping and a bit of careful alignment, but unfortunately there were still a few gaps to clean up. Kinda looks like a happy frog. Anyway, once again I used sprue goo to fill in these fairly annoying gaps. I guess it's not really annoying, I'm just not overly patient sometimes. Moving swiftly on, the outer wing sections were then glued to the centre fuselage section. I suppose it's all one wing really, it's like a huge flying wing. Anyway, these went on with a fairly positive fit, but there was a gap on the wing join. Reference photos for the only surviving aircraft show a very slight shift between the wings, 
But at this scale, I figured that it would look like I'd built the model badly. And on contemporary photographs, there does appear to be a strip of rib tape where the wings join the center section. So I decided to fill the seams properly and hopefully completely hide the join. Once again, this was done with sprue glue, patience and some sanding. To make sure I only sanded off what I needed to, I used some of these rigid humbral sanding blocks. Because these are nice and stiff, they go a decent way to helping everything I sand stay absolutely level. A good test to see if your sanding join is acceptable is to spray it with some primer. This will usually show up any flaws pretty much immediately. And also, as I'm using Mr. Surfacer 1500, it also acts as a very light filler in itself. And after a fair amount of work, these joints don't look too bad. There may be some more fettling needed in the primer stage, but we'll see later on. The two gondolas were then joined to the huge wing. This was quite a fiddly step, as although there were some locator pins, the fit wasn't completely positive. So it did take some judging and some tape to make sure these parts dried in the right place. With the wing and gondolas done, it was time to move on to some of the other details on the build. So next up, I attacked the control surfaces. The ailerons fit really nicely and didn't need any extra work. But the vertical stabilizers and rudders needed a bit of tweaking. The holes for these parts needed widening a little bit. And then there was some photo etch to attach. I'm not shy of photo etch, but these parts were a bit of a pain. And the worst offender, well, it had to be the crossbar that went across the top of the three vertical stabilizers. This part was hellish and it caused so much suffering, pain and anguish. And I've handily condensed it down into a small clip for you to watch. I don't know why, but this piece really got me. And I mean, the footage you're seeing now is about, well, I don't know, 20 seconds. I must have spent about 20 minutes trying to get this into the right place. The second lot of parts that caused me a great deal of pain were the tail booms. Because the attachment points to the tailplane were so thin, I had these break off several times throughout the rest of the build. In hindsight, instead of just gluing them with styrene cement, I should have pinned them, but then the attachment points even for pinning weren't very big, so I don't know if that would have made a difference. Anyway, to make sure they dried in the right position, I carefully taped the entire tail boom to the fuselage assembly, just until the glue had set. I really don't want the tail of the aircraft sitting at a funky angle. Once the tail assembly had dried, I moved on to the section next to the cockpit. This comes as a separate piece because on different variants of the aircraft, there are different features, like portholes or extra windows. Next up was to assemble the engine mount superstructure. This came in several parts and had to be carefully lined up. I had to take extra care with the leg sections to make sure once again that the parts dried at the right angles. Messing up this assembly, like the tail assembly, will make everything look a bit skew if, which on such prominent features wouldn't be ideal. On some reference pictures, I saw that there was a crew hatch behind the cockpit canopy, so I designed up and printed one myself. This was carefully glued in place with VMS Flexi CA. I then used the supplied paint masks to mask the canopy. These came in a light grey vinyl and conformed fairly nicely to the canopy surface. 
The canopy was then glued in place with VMS Transfer Fix. This is a fairly slow setting clear glue, which meant I had time to adjust the position to make sure the canopy sat just right. Also, handily, if you have sausage fingers and drop it a bit, and happen to get glue in areas you don't want it, it cleans off really easily with VMS Universal Weathering Carrier. So if you do a stupid, like this, you can just wipe the excess away. Lovely. This rather ridiculously small part is a guide I printed for the rigging. It's basically a small flat rectangular section with a tube on it. I was hoping that I would be able to use these as a positive locator for the rigging wires. I'm using tape here as kind of a ruler to make sure it all lines up nicely. These small round things are pulleys for the control cables. The original kit part was just a disc of photo etch, so while these parts are again absolutely tiny, I thought they'd add a little bit extra detail to those big smooth wings. Right, let's get some paint on this model. First up, the whole model was primed with Mr. Surfacer 1500 Black. This was thinned with Mr. Leveling Thinner at a ratio of 60% thinner, 40% primer. I sprayed this fairly wet and built it up in several light coats. Mr. Surfacer is such a durable primer. If you haven't tried it before, I highly recommend it. After you finish priming the model, it's a good idea to check the finish for any blemishes that you may need to fix. Like here, some of my filling had sunk, so I needed to sand it flush. But after several back and forths between sanding and priming, it all worked out okay. There were a fair few blemishes to fix post priming on this model. As you can see here, it's pretty messy. But after another coat of primer, everything was ready for paint. I did loads of research for the paintwork on this, and it all boiled down to an aluminium style finish. Think aluminium paint over fabric. So I decided to mix in some grey with some aluminium to try and replicate a dull kind of silver colour. But during my research I found several possible options that this aircraft could be. On the Stormo website it stated that seaplanes of a certain era were painted in a dark Italian grey. This didn't match up with my reference images which did look like a dull aluminium paint. Some other reference images I saw actually showed a dull finish that didn't look aluminium at all. So after painting 99% of my model in a dull aluminium colour, I decided to change my mind and paint it grey instead. The base colour I used for this was MRP416 Harioka Shoku blue-grey version with about 30% 415 green-grey version added. This was carefully black-based over the whole airframe, built up with several layers of models finished with a final blend layer, just to blend everything in so it didn't look too stark. Because there are such large expanses of bare space on this aircraft, I wanted to make sure there was enough tonal variation to keep the viewer interested. I always find it tricky when I'm painting a large single colour vehicle. It's hard to keep that paint finish interesting, but I do have a few tricks up my sleeve later on in case it doesn't quite work out. You might think that there probably is an excessive amount of footage of me doing the blend layer, and I'll agree with you, there is, but I wanted to show how subtly I built up this final layer. It's built up with really light transparent layers of paint, because I really didn't want to hide all that previous paintwork and then have to do it all again, again. But anyway, it's just to give you the idea. For the next part of the painting, I had to paint the anti-foul colour on the underside of the gondolas. There was again conflicting evidence as to what colour it should be. It was between green and black, and I went for a generic green. This was again built up in a similar black-based way as before. Next up, I removed the canopy masks. Removing them at this stage was essential because I had to put the engines on top and I wouldn't have been able to reach. As for the engines, you can't see it very well, but I did wire up the spark plugs. At this scale, it was really tedious and hard to film, so I didn't bother. Once that fine work was done, they were sprayed with Mr. Color GX2 Gloss Black. 
This was thinned with Mr. Leveling Thinner and then followed with Alclad Aluminium. It's best to build these paints up lightly to maintain the sheen of the metallic paint. Nice and slow with lots of thin layers. I then painted the piston blocks with Vallejo Matte Black. This was applied with one of my favourite detail brushes, the Artist Opus 2.0 Kalinsky Sable. The only downside to one piece engines is you've usually got to paint this and it can be quite finicky. But in 172, I take a one piece engine. Some of the pipework was painted with Vallejo Copper. This is quite a nice colour but it needs to be built up in several thin layers. The radiator was painted with Mr. Hobby Super Metallic Super Gold 2. These are also a really nice range of metallics. This was thinned about 60% Mr. Leveling Thinner to 40% paint. I had 3D printed some exhaust pipes for the engine. These were painted in Alclad Steel and then Alclad Pale Burnt Metal before finishing off the tips of the exhaust with a mix of MRP Black and MRP Burnt Iron. This was definitely some steady hand airbrushing. I then added a wash to the engine of Abtelung 502 sepia mixed with Abtelung 502 engine grease. A nice bit of grime to a nice engine. These oils were once again thinned with VMS Universal Weathering Carrier. Fitting the engines and radiators to the top of the plane was a bit of a faff. Firstly, there was a brass pipe underneath that needed to be glued to both engines and the radiator at the same time. I needed like six hands to be able to do this properly, but I managed to figure out a way. Also, the hole for the propeller shaft didn't line up through the radiator and the engine, which was a bit short-sighted of the designers, but that won't get in my way. Once the engines were stuck down, I glued in place my 3D designed oil tank. The kit part was okay, but it had a hard seam to clean up, so I decided to model my own. I then added the remaining pipework with some random scraps of metal wire. The smaller wires attached to the engine a 0.2mm lead wire. The larger wire, I'm not quite sure what it is, I just found it in my spares box. Right, let's add some decals. As per usual, the decals were shown some warm water for about 5 seconds. And whilst the glue was loosening up between the backing paper and the decal, I brushed in place some decal set and fix to help with adhesion. The decals were then carefully slid into place. There weren't many decals to apply, but there was a considerably large one on the tail. I tried applying the Italian tricolore flag but it didn't seem to quite match up with the rudder properly. I mean, it was close enough and you could touch up the edges with some paint, but I completely forgot that on the inner surfaces, there would also be the same decal and there's a metal piece in the way. So I had to go nuclear. The parts were carefully removed from the aircraft and again, sanded smooth. I felt a bit bad after spending so much time on that crossbar to have to remove the rudders, but you gotta do what you gotta do. The rudder pieces were based with MRP white before using some SMS Italian red for the red parts. Since using decent lacquers like MRP and SMS, I haven't had as much trouble with bright colors like reds and yellows. They just go down so nicely. Anyway, I didn't have the right green, so I had to mix my own. I used Vallejo light green, flat green and blue to approximate the color alongside the green on the decal sheet. I don't usually like spraying Vallejo colors because they can be a tad finicky, but using some thinners from the sprue box helped things move along. The paint was still a bit grainy and it would be a bit delicate because it's an acrylic, but it'll do the job. On one of the sides, I added the Italian emblem decal to the rudder, but being a bit of a twit, I misplaced the one on the other side, so I had to brush paint it. It's not perfect, but it'll do.
The decals were then sealed in with a layer of VMS matte varnish HD before moving on to some oil work. Well, hey, I got a new color. For most of the oil weathering, I used Abtalung 502 Starship Filth alongside a little bit of white for some variation. This was thinned with VMS Universal Weathering Carrier Light and thinned to a fairly thin consistency. How many times do you want to hear me say thin? Needless to say, it was thin. Thin, thin, thin. Idiotic ramblings aside, the wash was brushed carefully around the few surface details on the aircraft. In some areas, it did require a little cleanup once the oil had started to dry. Some of my oil paints had started to go a bit grainy, so I thought I needed to invest in a few new colours. And I really like this Starship Filth Fade. Has sepia finally been replaced? Once all the washing was done, it was time to add some more tonal variation. I started by fading some of the big surfaces with some white. This was moderately thinned and then brushed into little dabs. Then with some bad videography, I blended the white into the paint surface. I didn't really think the angle through here, my hand kept getting in the way. And it does look more blended in real life than it did on the video. Next up, using Starship Filth again, I added some artificial shading around the ailerons. This was lightly thinned, brushed in place, and then blended in with several brushes. The next step was to add some grime and dirt around the walkways and the openings on the aircraft. I used some more Starship filth and dabbed this in a random manner in the areas that I wanted to be dirty. I also used different thicknesses for different levels of staining. This mix was then blended in in a stippling motion with my ProArt Soft Blender brush. Any excess was then cleaned off from the hatches with Universal Weathering Carrier. For the final stage of the oil weathering, I added some speckling. I used some highly diluted Starship filth and speckled this over the entire model's surface with a small brush. Hopefully the variety and sizes of the stains and splatters will add a lot of visual interest to the final result. I then blended in some of the splashes with my soft brush. This was done in a stipply motion to preserve the splash look. The same process was then repeated, but this time with titanium white oil paint. There wasn't too much rigging to do on this aircraft, but the rigging that was on there was quite visible so I had to be careful to do a neat and tidy job. It was a bit of a pain to thread the Infinity model rigging wire through my 3D printed rigging guides. It required a steady hand and several attempts. I left this section of footage in so you could see how awkward it was to thread it through. Once the rigging wire was through the tiny holes, I pulled it taut in preparation for the next part. I used VMS Flexi 5K CA for PE to glue the rigging wire to the pulley and the control horns. This was pulled taut, stuck in place, and then the excess was carefully trimmed away. I was a little bit nervous about attaching the tail boom to the main body of the aircraft, but because I tried my best to make sure it would line up early on in the build, this was relatively hassle free. It just took some steady hands and some patience. With the tail attached, I could move on to further parts of the rigging. These connected the tail up with the main body. 
Next up, and probably one of the most delicate parts of the build, was adding this 3D printed pitot tube. This was then followed by the painting of the propeller. Both sets of propellers were given a coat of MRP pale wood. This colour makes a great base for some oil painted wood grain. I wanted the propellers to be a rich dark brown, so I mixed up some sepia, burnt sienna and alizarin crimson oil paints, just a touch of the red, and this was brushed liberally over all the surfaces of the propellers. Once this was done, I used an old watercolour filbert sable brush to gently brush in some impressions of wood grain. I really like the process of painting wood grain. It kind of sends you into a trance. This technique is really useful, and although it does require a little bit of practice, it can give some really impressive, realistic results. Have you tried using oil paint for wood grain before? Let me know in the comments below. And if you haven't, I do have a handy wood grain tutorial on my channel. So go take a look at that. The next step was to paint my 3D printed gun mounts. This was one of the first items I designed for this kit because the plastic parts looked a bit bulky and I think they came out all right. These were painted with MRP black. Now the machine guns I didn't design but I did have to modify them as the Italian Lewis gun of this era had a conical sleeve just at the end of the barrel. I believe this was for extra cooling. So I took a stock one-to-one -one Lewis gun added the sleeve and then scaled it down. So those should be scale thicknesses. Anyway, the guns were painted with a mix of Alclad steel and MRP black before being glued carefully into place. I then glued the propellers on with some VMS Flexi 5K CA for photo etch. And with these final pieces, the build, was complete. I'd like to give a huge thanks to my patrons for supporting my work. Things have been a bit spartan at the moment, but it does look like my mojo is picking up. So thank you so much for your support. The SM55 is a really quirky looking aircraft, and I think that's what drew me to this build. Initially, it was supposed to be a one week mojo buster, but that wasn't gonna happen. In reality, the build took me about a month and a half, which I suppose for me at the moment is actually pretty quick. But at the end of it, I'm actually really pleased with the result. It's a little rough around the edges in some areas, but for my first short run kit in a long time, I think I did really well. Let me know what you think in the comments below. This model and some of my other ones will be on display at the model show I mentioned at the beginning of the video. So if you're in the Southwest of the UK or anywhere nearby, come and have a look and maybe say hello if you spot me. Anyway, I'm James from LPJ Models and I really hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you for watching.